in the previous class we talked about uh, bending stresses i think in the previous class we talked about uh, solving the two problems which i have uh, given as an assignment uh, for which you had to use the idea of bending stresses bending stresses and uh, shear stresses uh, so just to um, so so this is where uh, this is where we where we we came up with a formula for bending stresses we derived a formula for bending stress at different points in the cross section of a beam and we found out that we usually have a profile like this when you have a positive bending moment you have a compressive stresses at the top and tensile stresses at the bottom and somewhere in between this uh, uppermost layer and lowermost layer you have a neutral point where bending stress becomes zero so this is all good now now we also know that bending stresses are normal stresses so in 2d problems we in addition to normal stresses we also have shear stresses so for bending of beams what is the value of shear stresses how how does the shear stress vary in the cross section what causes the shear stress can we come up with an equation for shear stress so these are the questions we are going to ask and try to answer in this class so so i'll just show you a video uh okay before that to get a uh, intuitive idea of uh, how and why bending stress appear uh, how and why shear stress appear let's uh, we used to in the previous class not in the previous class for uh, for uh, for certain simple problems in mechanics if you have a very if you have a if you have a bar that has a very small cross sectional area if there is a shear force v acting on this area a we know that by definition shear stress this v by a shear force divided by area now this is an approximation this is a very severe approximation so we do take this approximation sometimes but in general this is not true especially for beams where cross sectional area has a lot of significance and impact on the values of stresses so this is but still you can say this is the kind of average shear stress in this area so how does it actually vary so to to uh to remind you of an another aspect if you have a if you have a shear force v here and let's say this is a very small area dx uh, i mean very small lung dx element of a differential lung dx extremely small and there is a let's say there is a shear force v here 
and because of this shear force v shear force v what will be the bending moment at this point bending moment will nothing uh, bending moment is nothing but the shear force multiplied by uh, shear force multiplied by this length that is basically the definition of moment the force multiplied by the uh, perpendicular distance between line of action of force and the point about which we are taking moment so bending moment is uh, uh, VDX and uh, for, for this uh, uh, since we have considered a since we have considered a differential length let's call let's say this for for uh, the moment generated in moment generated uh, due to this shear force over a different differential length dx is dm so if you integrate this throughout the length you get the uh, value of total value of moment so for, for a very small uh, cut part of beam where you have a where you have moment m on this side and the beam uh, the small beam element we have considered has a length dx and and on the other side you have m plus dm so this uh, shear force which is acting at different shear force which is available at different cross sections cause an incremental incremental uh, addition of bending moment which adds up and which can be integrated over a length to find out the total bending moment uh, this is something you already know for uh, drawing uh, you, you must have learned how to draw bending moment diagrams right bending moment diagram and shear force diagram from uh, there you must have explicitly uh, uh, at many problems uh, you must have used the fact that uh, shear shear force is a derivative of bending moment so what i have written here is the uh, is the same thing right uh, dm or dx is equal to v it's essentially the same thing so i, I, I just like to remind you of this thing and uh, i'll show you a video here so if there is a so let's consider a cross section of a beam and at this point in the beam for the uh, along the cross section of the beam we have considered a small portion at which a certain value of shear stress is acting so shear stress always comes with a complementary part that is something we have already learned uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, the, the whole subject so these are the complementary shear stresses at a certain uh, considered portion in the cross section beam cross section now so this uh, when you have a shear which causes a shear stress here there is always a complementary shear stress in this direction and that is present throughout the same layer now 
Now, why is it significant? How, how does that? Uh, uh, how is that intuitive? Can, can, how can we understand that idea more intuitively? Let's say let's consider the whole beam as a few planks of a uh, few different planks of material put one over one over the other. Now, if this is our beam, what happens when you apply a force, vertical force, a shear force? on the end of the beam you can see that the different planks slides one over the another so this is essentially the uh, you know the, the the idea of shear stress right shear stress always tend to uh, deform any material in this way w one layer of material tends to uh, tends to slide over the other layer of layer of material when shear stresses are being acted upon the material so so this is the shear flow uh, this is the shear stress i've talked about i've shown you in the previous see such a such a set of uh, such values of shear stresses are actually necessary when you have a beam on which you have shear force being applied so such a internal resistive shear stress is necessary to sustain vertical loads so that that is kind of intuitive for you from this uh, uh, illustration where we consider beam as a set of plank uh, set of uh, few different material planks So in, in between these planks, there is always a shear stress. So this is the uh, ideal, uh, this is the actual case. When the material is continuous, uh, and let's say, I mean, uh, I, I can't say this is the ideal case. If, if the material is, in, in uh, reality, material cannot actually slide over one, one over the another. Material is continuous so it deforms so this uh, tendency to deform causes the shear stress which are uh, illustrated in this figure so, so uh, if you assume that these planks are uh, pasted to each other using gum so the kind of action on the gum is essentially the shear stress so the glue, the gum is supposed to uh, cause an internal resistive force to sustain the vertical loads. So this is the basic idea of uh, shear stresses in beams. So we can, uh, uh, we also know that when you have a, a, a wooden plank or something, a wooden beam, there is always a scope of failure uh, due to shear stresses also. So you can, uh, failure can happen due to bending stresses. Sometimes failure can also due to shear stresses. In this case, uh, when there is a crack horizontally, that usually happens due to uh, shear stresses. So you can see that uh, 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 the, the direction of the crack actually justifies our assumption. Now let's come to the idea of distribution of shear stresses. Shear stresses are not distributed equally. Shear stresses, in this figure you can see that the larger magnitude of shear stresses uh, are plotted at the middle and at the uh, topmost and bottommost points the values of shear stresses are lower and like I told you before the average shear stress over the entire cross section can be written as uh, tau is equal to V by A but the actual value of shear stress at different point in the cross section will be different and we need to 
come up with a formula to find out the value of shear stress at uh, different points in the cross section so let's try to derive that equation So now, uh, <coughs> now let's try to derive a formula for shear stresses. Now to begin with, Now we are we, we have a let's say we have a We have a beam which is fixed on a wall and let's say there is a, a force on the beam, let's say upward force or any other kind of distributed forces moment something because of which there, there is a, there are shear forces and bending moments throughout the length what i've uh, what you see here in the figure b is a section of this beam i have uh, cut out i have uh, cut out a small part from the beam this part is cut out and drawn here and what is this length this is an uh, differential length dx an infinitely small magnitude so dx uh, <coughs> that this is a small cut part and and we know that there are uh, bending stresses in the beam about which we have uh, already a, a very fair idea so these are the bending stresses and you, you have a, a compressive stresses at the upper part of the beam and tensile stresses at the lower part of the beam and at neutral axis you have a zero bending stress these are all the things you already know now we have discussed that uh, uh, now we will take a uh, uh, this is the sectional view of this uh, part from this side let's say the beam has a width b now we will consider a, 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 a section at the top of the beam i uh, g g h i f Uh, so this F G H I F G H I section is being considered. Why are we considering that section? You will see that soon. We will take a section. We will consider this section and we will remove that section from this part, from the cut out part of the beam which have which have drawn here, which is shown here in the figure B. From that. I will consider a section uh, F G H I and it will be removed. So this is the section. And for that particular section you have uh, bending stresses acting on either side. And this bending stresses together will constitute a force on either side. So let us say that uh, uh, this section uh, is called A B. This, this, uh, we have 
we are taking this section from point A to point B and it has a length dx. So, this is that section AB. So, at phase A you have force FA acting on it because of bending stresses on the side A and on that uh, on that other phase B you have force FB acting on it because of bending stresses on the other side. So, if that is the case, we can calculate the value of these forces F A and F B. Right. We can do that. Uh, and uh, why are we doing that? We will see that soon. So, so now, uh, yeah, let us do that. Let us try to find out the value of FB and FA. what will be the value of FB? FB, you can obtain FB by integrating uh, stresses. stresses throughout the area. So, this is basically the area integral. Okay, The area integral throughout this section the area, this considered area will give us the total force. Integration of stress is the total force. Integration of what kind of stresses? Integration of bending stresses. And that is, uh, that is an idea you are quite familiar with and uh, at the top part you have uh, compressive stresses. Uh, uh, compressive stresses means you have a negative sign. So, the uh, we know that from the bending stress formula, the bending stress value, okay, I will write down. Uh, so, the bending stresses, okay, the, the integration of the all of these bending stresses throughout the area. So, if, if uh, a small area here is called d a and integral d a, integral sigma d a over the whole area will give you the force f b and the sigma is nothing but uh, from bending, from bending stress formula you know that it is nothing but m y by i and m, m is nothing but the bending moment on the phase B. Alright. And uh, that means uh, minus MB divided by I MB divided by I uh, M is a constant for the section and I is also constant for the whole section and what you have there remaining is YD and integral y d a, what is integral y d a? That is the first moment of area for the given area. Let us uh, first moment of area, we will simply use uh, the, the letter q for that. Integral y d a is q. 
which is the first moment of area. What is the first magnitude of first moment of area? Its definition is integral y dA and uh, that means uh, the area multiplied by distance between the centroid of the area to the neutral axis y bar. So q is equal to uh, the area of uh, of the section the whole area of the section multiplied by y bar ok let's just call it y bar and that q uh, q will be written here as such and it is uh, mb by minus mb q by i similarly on the other side you can calculate the net force and that will be we will get a similar formula for that and that will be m a q by i so so that is uh, quite uh, obvious now let's find the difference between these forces why are we finding the, uh, the difference between these forces because if you take out this section and if we draw all external forces on it this uh, part this section this this uh, particular uh, shape or considered volume should be in equilibrium right net force in any direction should be in equilibrium right? so uh, what kind of forces you have in this direction you have f a f b so f a should f a be equal to f b well if there are no other kind of stresses and that should be equal and let's see if they are equal let's consider the let's find out the difference between f a and f b since we have uh, we are taking the difference over a small length d x so this length is d x d x here which is a differential length let's uh, so, so we are calling the difference df integral d um df so so that is the uh, difference between we are trying to find out the difference between magnitude of fb and fa so so from the equilibrium uh, the idea of equilibrium we, we kind of uh, uh, from seeing that picture we kind of uh, feel like this difference should be zero but that's not zero you can see that uh, that will be what uh, f b minus f a is nothing but m b minus m a m b minus m a into q by i So if M B minus M A is uh, zero, that would be fine. But that's not the case always. You know that uh, bending uh, moment doesn't need to be constant throughout the length of the beam. It can be, it can vary. So that's the reason. That's basically the reason why you draw uh, bending moment diagrams. You know that bending moment diagram can have variations. So so for uh, a different through for a differential length dx I'll we'll call that uh, difference dm so it's dm q by i so So df is equal to integral, uh, not integral, in, uh, dm q by i. Now what, what if we find out the derivative of the whole thing about uh, uh, with respect to x, we will get df dx is equal to dm or dx into q by i so this is the change in force in longitudinal direction 
for for unit change in longitudinal direction now what is uh, dm over dx dm over dx dm over dx is nothing but the shear force right you can see that dm over dx is nothing but shear force by definition so dm over dx is equal to v so we have v q by i so this quantity df over dx will be called q this quantity df over dx will be called q and we will name it shear flow so the shear flow arises due to the fact that uh, for a uh, differential element considered like this for such an element to be in equilibrium there exists an extra uh, there is a, there should exist a shear stress at this bottom layer of the considered section for this part to be in equilibrium and that and that sh that shear stress is described uh, using the quantity called q so 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 this is not exactly the shear stress the shear stress should be what should be the shear stress that should be that difference that should be the force divided by area and dx is only the length in the longitudinal direction so for that to become shear stress you have to divide it with the breadth of the so dx is the longitudinal length of this lower surface the breadth of the surface is b so you must divide the force with area so that should be dx multiplied by b or shear flow multiplied by b a uh, shear flow divided by b so so that is vq by uh, i b so this is the shear stress shear stress is equal to vq by i b and if b is varying uh, for for the element we have for the beam we have considered here b is constant uh, throughout the length but that doesn't need to be the case all the time so if it's varying if it's a function of y if it's continuously varying in different for example if you consider i section you, you know that at the top and bottom layer you have larger value of uh, breadth so so i think uh, it's a good idea to use another letter t if breadth is varying that's not a rule that's something I, 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 we, I see T more often uh, in some textbooks I think 
so i think for for our purpose we'll use b if b is constant that this constant if that this varying we'll use t so vq by it is the formula for bending stress and uh, and here v is the v here is equal to shear force i here is equal to what is i second moment of uh, second moment of area or moment of inertia about the neutral axis for the cross section now t is the breadth and q is equal to ay bar and what is ay bar if you are considering such an area this cross section cross sectional area is uh, not the whole cross sectional area the shaded area considered uh, so if you are if you are if you want to calculate shear stress at this point you have to ca calculate the whole area above that particular point so that area will be a and y bar is the distance between center road of that area uh, to the center road of the whole area or neutral axis so this is the formula we wanted to derive now Uh, this is interesting because if you use this formula you will find out that how do you how do you compare it against the bending stress formula if you have uh, some arbitrary section let's say you have a, a beam let's say you have a beam section like this and you would like to calculate the bending stress at this point and let's say this is the neutral axis so this is the neutral axis so if you would like to calculate uh, bending stress at this point bending stress will be equal to m y by i so of course uh, uh, you need to take care of the direction so if you have positive bending moment we usually have uh, compressive stresses at the top let's say the magnitude of uh, we are just calculating the magnitude of stress so that will be equal to m y by i where where y is the vertical distance between the layer at which we want to calculate bending stress and uh neutral axis and i is of course the area moment of inertia about neutral neutral axis and m is the bending moment and how do we calculate the shear stress at this point to calculate sh shear stress at this point you have to use the formula vq by it where where v is the shear force at the given cross section and i is again area moment of inertia about neutral axis and t is the breadth at 
the point the layer for which you are considering uh, calculating tau of shear stress and what is q q is equal to a y bar where a is the where a is the area above the point for which we are calculating shear stress for in this case uh, the shaded area will be a and y bar will be the distance between y bar will be the distance between let's say this is centroid of this shaded area y bar will be the distance be between centroid of this section uh, the shaded area and the neutral axis this is y bar so here for the same section for the same beam section this is how we calculate bending stress and shear stress uh, so this idea uh, seem a little this idea can seem a, uh, can be a little confusing in the beginning but you need to once you have some practice on this topic if you uh, solve some problems and uh, do more reading on this topic you will you'll be comfortable with, the, with these ideas uh, and uh, and let's uh, so so that's about the derivation we have calculated the uh, we have uh, found out the formula for shear stress now let's see uh, how how the shear stress vary and how do we compare it against the value of bending stress for in this case uh, not this case let's uh, choose a simpler case if we have a if we have a rectangular cross section how does the bending stress vary if you have a positive bending moment the bending stress bending stress vary like this you have the maximum bending stresses at topmost and bottommost layer of the beam and you have zero you have zero bending stress at the neutral axis but for this formula you can see that the maximum value does not occur at the bottom and topmost point of the section instead maximum values of shear stress happens at the middle part and at the top most and bottom most layer shear stress will be zero why is that zero because when you consider the top most layer again the area above that layer will be zero which means which means shear stress is zero so for a given cross section v shear stress shear force is constant i is constant t can change but if you are considering a rectangular cross section then t will be constant and uh, that will not change but in general t can change q q makes all the difference in case of shear stress q is equal to a y bar where a is the area above the point uh, about the point for which you are considering the calculating the shear stress so that area becomes smaller when the point goes far from the neutral axis and it becomes zero at the topmost point similarly uh, 
for the points below neutral axis also the same thing happens the shear stress becomes zero at the bottom most layer and it will have maximum value at the neutral axis so if this is the bending stress profile the profile for shear stress will look something like this shear stress will be zero at top most and bottom most point and shear stress will be maximum at the middle and average shear stress will be of course v by a and the distribution can be calculated using the formula which we have derived and uh, we can also find out the maximum value of shear stress for each uh, for different types of cross section which we will do later so i will uh, close the class close the lecture for today